Now the second research project I want to do, and I want to set it beside the first, has to do with modeling the acquisition of the past tense by young language learners in English. Um, most verbs in all languages have perfectly regular forms in the different tenses. In English we have a simple past tense and you form it by putting ed at the end of the word if you're writing or some pronounced variation of ed. So from walk we get walked, from trance we get tranced, and so on. But there are a lot of verbs which have irregular forms um, and they need to be learned individually. So these include all the most frequent verbs of English. And in this respect, English is quite like every other language. Um, those verbs which are used most frequently, the verbs to have, to get, to go, to be, are uh, frequently, if not inevitably, irregular. So in English, we have go with a past tense went instead of goed. Spent, spend has a past tense spent instead of spended, and so on. And there's little systematicity here. Children exhibit a very predictable sequence here. Initially, they seem to learn each verb form as um, an exemplar. So they learn walked and they learn went and they're doing just fine. But then there comes a point when they seem to have noticed that there's a regularity, when they suddenly seem to disimprove on the irregular verbs and they start using um, regular, in, regularly inflected forms for the irregular verbs. So instead of go went, we get children saying go goad and the, he hitted me and I spended my money. And these forms come out after a period in which the child has been producing the correct forms. And this happens regularly. It's a part of what it is to learn English. And a regularity of this sort demands our attention and there's no shortage of theories in the area. So much like the uh, Schaffer and Marshall and Stager and Werker work we looked at, this is another slightly puzzling case where initial, what appears to be progress, seems to go backwards. We get non-monotonic learning, so or unlearning. Um, what you can see is that initially the child is treating each verb form as if it was unconnected to everything else. And then at some stage they figure out the rule for making past tense forms and they over apply it. And then they have to learn the exceptions individually again. This suggests two different kinds of learning. There's uh, learning individual examples, then there's the induction of a rule, and then after a while there's a recognition that one is overdoing it, and so individual examples have to be learned again just for the irregular verbs. That kind of account of development is precisely the area where connectionist models continually come in, and this has been an early and frequent battleground between connectionists and anti-connectionists back in an era when this had a strongly ideological flavour to the whole thing. Notice how the debate here mirrors the debate that we just saw in previous work. That is, should we understand the child as having a series of qualitatively different stages in which different learning mechanisms are in play? Or can we account for this with a single generic learning mechanism and allow the richness of the world to allow such differentiated structures to emerge? That's the basic question. Well, one of the first contributions here is a very old neural network from 1986, the same year the PDP books were produced, but this had already been served its purpose as a modeling paradigm, and it's an old perceptron model. So no, tra oh, well, sorry, it was trained using the perceptron convergence procedure. This is a standard single layered perceptron with two layers with a stepwise activ um, activation function on the outputs. And its goal was to map from a representation of the verb stem, that is the bit without the tense at the end, so for um, um, create, for example, the stem is create, and the form created has the stem plus a suffix. So the stem 
is the input and the past tense form is the output. And the representations were developed once more in accordance with phonological theories. This is the third time I think we've seen this, where we draw on the resources of phonology in order to express the um, rule-based um, sequencing of sounds in language. And it was trained gradually using the perceptron convergence procedure. Why was this done? Well, look at what the underlying question is. Are there stages with different forms of learning? Or is there a single generic learning mechanism? Well, this was trained on 420 combinations of stem and past tense. And during training, the network was found to over-regularize. Um, that is, to start to generate past tense forms that look like they were derived by the rule that adds ed. And there seemed to be an interaction between the irregular verbs and regular verbs during training. After sufficient training, both irregular and regular forms were produced correctly, and only one mechanism was used. How about them apples? This looks like a significant contribution to the debate, showing that you don't need separate learning mechanisms in order to have this strange non-linear um, profile of acquisition. Here's a slide showing the errors produced by this network over time, over training. The y-axis here is the percent correct productions. And there are two plots there, one for the regular verbs, which as you can see, simply get better and better and better. And there's one for the irregulars where there's a, an abrupt drop and then gradually getting better. So this looks absolutely wonderful. It looks like we used our connectionist model to robustly challenge the claim that there are multiple different learning procedures going on inside the child. A single generic learning procedure seems to be sufficient. But that discontinuity hides a piece of sleight of hand here. The initial training of this for the first 10 epochs was on eight irregular verbs and two regular verbs. They then changed the training set to allow all 420 verbs. So this is not a discontinuity in the learning procedure, but it is a substantial discontinuity in the data set that the network is exposed to. So the claim of such connectionist models to challenge the um, developmental account that has a, a discontinuity in learning mechanisms appears to be um, at very best weak. One might instance this as a case of, if not fraud, at least very misleading interpretation of a model. But the issues at stake about continuity of development and the discreteness of developmental stages meant that this was really just the first attempt to contribute, and this debate has been gone over many, many times since. So in 1991, for example, Plunkett and Marchman worked much harder on this to produce a, a network with a consistent training set, and they made a very important distinction Previously, there was a verb form, and it came with its past tense. And if you had 420 verbs, that was 420 stems and 420 past tenses. That acts as if each verb occurs at exactly the same frequency as every other verb. The thing about irregular verbs is they are always the most frequent verbs in a language. So the child is actually exposed to irregular verbs much more frequently than to regular verbs. So the design of the training set is absolutely crucial. We saw that there was something very misleading about the design of the training set and the discontinuity introduced in the previous example. Here, however, they made care took care that the training set reflected the frequencies of these verb forms as children might encounter them. And they developed error curves that produced the same kind of claim that challenged the psychologist's account of discrete 
um, stages. And this debate continues. There's been several more models. And the more detail we have about the um, precise nature of children's performance here, the more there is for modelers to cling on to and to build. And of course, we have to be aware that children differ very greatly. So we need to, if we're going to do a model that has some generality, we need to be able to distinguish between those characteristics which are highly idiosyncratic and those which are to be expected in a population of learners. So we've now seen the Human Speech Home project with its radically empirical agenda, its huge data science problems, um, its remarkable insights, and we've seen this modeling of the past tense. I think they bear comparison because they both are very interested in how children learn language. The, they differ greatly in the assumptions they share. Um, the role of experiment and hypothesis is very different in each, and I think it's worth your while contrasting them to make yourself aware that work in developmental psychology and human learning but in general will always be many faceted. There will be many, many approaches. Um, the work on learning the past tense was not terribly convincing there, but if I had presented instead one of the later models, it might have more accurately matched the characterization of the learning trajectory of the child as put out by the psychologists. Um, would that make a difference? Um, you need to make your own mind up about these things. So modeling plays a role in scientific work, um, but that role needs to be understood in conjunction with everything else from armchair pronouncements to um, wild guesses and so on.